Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome to the last lecture of our course on ADR and arbitration. I'm sure you must have learned good many things about the subject. We have covered the basic processes of ADR, including arbitration, conciliation, mediation, negotiation. I'm sure you understand the meaning of these, you understand the nuances of these. We have also discussed the difference between mediation and conciliation. The difference lies in terms of the role of the neutral third party, as I said in the previous lecture. I will try to conclude the entire discussion of all 20 lectures, maybe towards the end of this lecture. I would like to devote five, seven minutes on summary of whatever we have discussed so far in the course. I mentioned in the last lecture that there are advantages in various dispute resolution methods. There are some advantages of arbitration which you don't find in other methods. There are certain advantages of mediation which you don't find in other methods. Therefore, it is a wise idea to club various methods so as to invent a new hybrid method of dispute resolution. Go back to how I defined ADR in the first class. I said ADR is any consent based process which takes parties to settlement. So, whatever may be the method, whatever may be the name, if the process in question is a consent based process and if it takes parties to settlement, it can be called as a method of dispute resolution, an alternative method of dispute resolution. So, on the basis of the understanding that different methods have their unique characteristics and advantages, now I will discuss few methods which are mix of basic methods. Basic methods, I mean arbitration, mediation, conciliation, negotiation. So, I will be mixing the aspects of various basic uh, methods of dispute resolution to create hybrid methods of dispute resolution. Although in India, we are not used to many of these hybrid methods. These are not prevalent in Indian context, but these are prevalent in some of the Western countries. US, for example, uses uh, hybrid methods. One of the hybrid methods which I mentioned in the previous lecture as a form of mediation, as a model of mediation called as MedR is gradually gaining importance now in India also. And as the name suggests, it is a method made up of two basic methods. One is mediation, the other is arbitration. So, in this lecture, I will be discussing about hybrid forms of ADR on the assumption that you by now understand the basic methods. But before I come to the hybrid methods, let me introduce a concept called as multi-door courthouse. This concept was introduced by Professor E. A. Sander of Harvard University at, at a conference in 1976 called as Pound Conference, where he introduced the concept of multi-door courthouse. It was proposed as a multi-faceted dispute resolution center. And this was proposed because of dissatisfaction with the existing justice delivery system. Most of the cases in India are eventually resolved or, or decided by the courts. In Indian scenario, litigation is the rule and ADR is, is an exception. We are still not used to exploring alternatives to litigation. In countries like America, litigation is not the rule. Good number of cases, around 90% cases, I don't have the exact figure. Good number of cases are settled outside the court by adopting various other methods of dispute resolution. Now, Professor Sander proposed a multifaceted dispute resolution center because of the dissatisfaction with the existing justice delivery system. 
and he says that this center shall have two roles. One is screening, screening of dispute. The other is referring. That means there will be a room where the disputants will enter and the case of disputants will be screened first of all and then according to, depending on the nature of the dispute, the nature of relief they want to claim, they will be advised to go to one of the doors which are there. There will be different doors. One door will take you to litigation. One door will take you to arbitration, medar, mini trial, early neutral evaluation, concilio arbitration and many others. So depending upon the nature of the dispute, after screening the case, the next stage will be the referral. The mechanism, according to Professor Sander, the mechanism shall be used to decide as to which ADR is suited for the present dispute or which sequence of ADR mechanism will resolve it properly. Not every case must go to court. Not every case must get deluxe litigation. Cases which can be resolved, petty cases which can be resolved easily must not be sent to litigation because litigation has its own disadvantages. Cost and delay have become hallmarks of of litigation system, at least in, in India, because courts, dockets are full. So therefore, what this system will do, what this mechanism will do, it will decide which ADR is suited for your dispute, basic process, or which sequence of ADR mechanism, which hybrid system is suited for your case which basic process is suited for your case and which hybrid process is suited for your case. So therefore, it is important that people working in multi-door courthouse must have knowledge about all the ADR mechanisms. Only then they will be in a position to tell you which mechanism is best suited to resolve your dispute. He should know which mechanism should be used to resolve the dispute. So that is the idea which Professor E. A. Sander proposed in this conference. This is similar to, to any, any, any store where you go to purchase maybe a car. The person sitting there will first of all try to understand size of your family, size of your pocket. He understands which is the best car which you require and accordingly suggests a model. Something similar to that was proposed by Professor Sander. It is called multi-door courthouse. And as I said, it shall have two functions, screening the case and referring the matter to one of the modes which is best suited for your case. There are two kinds of reference. One is categorical referral of a general reference. Good number of cases will be generally referred to mediation. Medi there is presumption in favor of mediation, you see. The best method, the most efficient method of dispute resolution can be presumed to be mediation. So generally parties will be referred for mediation. That is general reference. The other kind is tailor-made referral based on special characteristics. Depending on the special characteristics of the matter, the nature of the dispute, there can be tailor-made reference. But before referring, one has to keep in mind certain factors. The first factor to be kept in mind is nature of the dispute. For example, if money claims are involved, you see, if money claims are involved, there is a method called as early neutral evaluation. In case of money claims, people usually don't want to change their positions. People, parties stick to their stand and therefore it is wise that parties may be sent to an evaluator who will evaluate the strength of their case and on the basis of which they will be in a better position to take a decision should they go for settlement or should they go to trial. Settlements usually are not liked by parties when there are money claims involved as I said. So, there are two options. Early neutral evaluation is one option. The second option is court annexed arbitration. Let the matter go for arbitration and let the matter go to a court annexed arbitration. The second point is if the nature of dispute is very complex, if it is a multi party dispute, 
for example, multi-party environmental dispute, as I said, mediation is presumed. So, what I am trying to say, what shall be the mode referred for your dispute shall first of all depend on the nature of the dispute. The second factor is relationship between the parties. Cases or disputes where parties have ongoing relationship, father, son, husband, wife, mediation may be a preferred option because mediation is a process which reorients relationships. If you recall in various models of mediation, I said one of the model is when parties are empowered. When there are relationship concerns, parties must not be sent to litigation because litigation has this potential to rupture the relationships, whereas mediation restructures relationships. So, first is nature of dispute. Second is relationship between the parties. If there are ongoing relationships, mediation is the preferred option because in mediation, the relationships are reoriented, restructured. There is a factor, for example, if parties have uneven bargaining power, settlements are not likely when the parties have uneven bargaining power. Voluntary settlements are difficult, but binding decisions are good when the parties have uneven bargaining power. But so what we can do, initial adjudication, initial phase of adjudication, we will make them equal in terms of bargaining power. That is the advantage of litigation. That is the advantage of adjudication. Everybody is equal. So, adjudication might be required to bring them on same footing. Then maybe after initial phase of adjudication, parties may be asked to opt out of adjudication and go for maybe mediation or some other mode. Section 89 kind of mechanism can be useful here, where parties are recommended to go for trial, un understanding that parties have uneven bargaining power. Settlement is not likely. So, therefore, in order to make them to come to the same level of bargaining power, first of all, send them to trial. During the trial, the bargaining power comes to the same level. Ask them to opt out using Section 89 kind of provision. They come out of it. They may be sent for more amicable methods of dispute resolution. And now, and now, both the parties will be willing to bargain across the table, sitting across the table. So, nature of dispute, relationship between the parties. The third concern is, the third factor to be kept in mind is history of negotiation between the disputants. Sometimes, it will provide a helpful clue concerning the most promising dispute resolution process. Parties have been negotiating it in past. If you Look into the history of negotiation, you will be in a position to understand the point where they differed. Did they differ on question of fact? Did they differ on question of law? Did they differ on their understanding of likely outcome? So, on the basis of negotiation history, you will be in a better position to, to decide which method will be useful for them. If they differ on, 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 on likely outcome, they understand the strength of their case, they, un, they, they agree on question of fact, still they differ on the likely outcome, possible outcome, then in that case early neutral evaluation may be recommended. So that is what I am saying. History of negotiation gives you important clue regarding the suitability of a particular dispute resolution mechanism in their case. The fourth factor to be taken into account is nature of relief sought. If the claimant, this is important, if the claimant wants to further his or her cause through widespread dissemination of the defendant's conduct, suppose it is an allegation of sexual harassment, and the claimant wants that this case, the behavior of defendant be known to everybody in the office, then in that case, private processes may not be useful. And in that case, the only option is to send the parties to court. But there are situations where there may be an allegation, but the claimant does not want the message to be spread. 
and that is a situation fit for private adjudication. So, therefore, it also depends on the nature of relief sought by the parties. I have already mentioned size and complexity of the claim, something similar to nature of dispute. Size and complexity of the claim. Even if it is high value claim, but if the matter is not complex, ADR is possible. Even if it is high value claim, but there is no complexity involved. If there is no complexity involved, let us not bring into picture litigation. Then it, the parties must not go to deluxe adjudication. We must also have to understand that when parties will come to the multi-door courthouse for the first time, they may not be voicing their real grievances because real stories surface at later of point of time. Maybe because of the reason that parties are not sophisticated litigants. Maybe they are in inarticulate in presenting their real grievances or maybe they deliberately don't disclose their real grievances or real relief which they want. There lies the ability of persons sitting in the multi-door courthouse. On the basis of certain anticipations and on the basis of narrations made by the parties, that courthouse will have to recommend one or the other modes of dispute resolution. So, this is important. These are the five factors which must be kept in mind before referring the dispute for one of the modes of dispute resolution. As I said, nature of dispute, relationship between the parties, history of negotiation between the disputants, nature of relief sought, size and complexity of the claim. Now, after having discussed the concept of multi-door courthouse, as I said, this courthouse will have multiple doors. What can be those multiple doors is the next question. Litigation is one, arbitration is one, basic processes which we discussed, mediation, negotiation, these are the doors. In addition to these doors, there are certain hybrid modes, doors which take you to hybrid modes. What are these hybrid modes? The first will be MEDARB, but we will come to MEDARB, but there are few questions which have to be answered. For example, should the referral made by the multi-door courthouse be a mandatory referral? Should the reference suggested by multi-door courthouse to the parties is a mandatory reference? Are the parties now compelled to go to that method? This should not be the approach because that will involve questions of law and policy. Let us go back to what we understand in section 89 of CPC. Section 89 of CPC also talks about something similar to it. It says, in case the, the, the presiding officer is of the view that there exists elements of settlement, then he will formulate terms of settlement, give it to the parties for consideration. He will reformulate terms of settlement and then will advise one of the modes mentioned in section 89. There are four modes mentioned. This is similar to what we are discussing. But at both the levels, first, whether parties want settlement, consent of the parties must be sought. Second, what mode is good for the parties? The court may advise them this mode is good for you, but ultimately it has to be decided by the parties. Consent of parties is required at both the levels. Something similar to this idea must evolve when we talk about multi-door courthouse. It should not be a mandatory referral because that will raise questions of law and policy. It should evolve like a system for helping the disputants to get a clear understanding of various options. Let them know that they have multiple options. Trial is not the only option. The system shall work on the understanding that to achieve satisfactory results, disputes should first be resolved by looking to the interest-based approach go to mediation, then maybe you can talk about right-based approach and as a matter of last resort, there may be resolution using power. So, trial therefore is a matter of last resort and mediation is presumed. So, that is the system on which multi-door courthouse shall function. Now, I was saying what other doors are there in multi-door courthouse? There are certain hybrid processes. The first one is MedArb. MedArb is a process which I said in the last class also is gradually gaining importance in a country like India, although we do not use it that often. Our familiarity with arbitration makes it a preferred choice, maybe tomorrow it will become a preferred choice. 
Medarb is time bound mediation followed by arbitration. So, initially parties will go for mediation for 30 days maybe and if mediation does not yield any settlement then maybe the same person who was the mediator becomes an arbitrator. It is good if parties have a stipulation in the contract that in case of dispute they will resolve it by way of mediation and if mediation fails to yield a settlement within the agreed time frame the matter shall be resolved by way of arbitration. It is good if you have this in your dispute resolution clause. As usually we write that any dispute arising out of this contract shall be resolved amicably and if the efforts to resolve amicably does not succeed then the matter shall be referred to arbitration to be done according to this particular method. Something similar to this is what I am proposing. You write in your contract, there include a stipulation in the contract. The matter will be first of all resolved by way of mediation within these many days and if that does not yield any settlement, then it shall be referred for arbitration. Now, it is for the parties to decide whether they ultimately want a binding arbitration or non-binding arbitration. It is an option. As long as we do not have a statute which provides the mechanism of MEDAR, parties have the freedom to decide whatever is the nature of arbitration they want to retain in the process of MEDAR. Do they want binding arbitration? Do they want non-binding arbitration? So, this process clubs two basic processes, mediation and arbitration, where the same mediator becomes arbitrator. If mediation fails, if it does not succeed, if it does not yield any settlement, then the same mediator becomes the arbitrator. There are certain advantages of MEDAR. Time is saved, fast process, time bound mediation. If this does not result, then arbitration. Arbitration to be done according to if arbitration conciliation act, then the time limit is 12 months. So, it is efficient in terms of time, it is cost effective, resources are saved since the same person performs the responsibility of both mediator as well as arbitrator. It becomes an efficient method because the information which the mediator must have received while acting as a mediator by using his. his subtle diplomacy, that information will become very useful during the stage of arbitration. So, in this case, the award passed after arbitration will be more acceptable to the parties. You understand because the mediator knows the strength of the case, know the interest of the parties, the knowledge which he acquired during the stage of mediation. So, these are the significant advantages. Since mediator is aware about the strength of the case, the information which he got during the stage of mediation by exercising his diplomacy skills, he will be using that information when he becomes arbitrator and then the award passed by him during arbitration shall be more acceptable to the parties. More acceptable means the chances of award being challenged in this case will be much less. But there are certain disadvantages also. One of the significant disadvantages is that one of the parties may not accept the suggestion proposed by the mediator. If the mediator is proposing a suggestion and I am consistently denying it, I am consistently denying it, then in that case mediator may develop some kind of bias against me. And this bias will start performing or affecting the decision of that person, neutral third person when he is acting as, a, as an arbitrator. So, the kind of neutrality which you expect from an arbitrator, you must, we have discussed it in section 12, the arbitrator must be independent, it must, he must be impartial. The kind of independence and impartiality which we expect from Arbitrator may not be there in MEDARP. This is one significant disadvantage. And you see, this, this apprehension is expressed in section 7580, where we have discussed during our session on conciliation, we have discussed that the conciliator cannot become an arbitrator between the same parties in relation to same matter. 
Why do we have this provision? Because we accept that there may be a possibility that the conciliator may have developed some kind of bias against someone who is consistently disturbing the process of mediation. That is one significant disadvantage, the possibility of bias. There are advantages. It is efficient in terms of time, in terms of money, in terms of resources. Then I said because the mediator is becoming arbitrator, so the award which he is going to pass is likely to be more acceptable, but there are disadvantages also which I mentioned here. Now let's talk about various forms of MEDAR. We use various terms to, for, for this process MEDAR. For example, there is something called as shadow mediation. Shadow mediation is when one or more facilitator is appointed who is a kind of shadow over the entire process. Your MEDAB is going on and you have some facilitators who are monitoring it. I just mentioned the possibility of bias. I said I may be biased if you are consistently opposing the, my efforts to settle while mediation is going on. So, therefore, I may be biased when I am arbitrating between you. Now, there is a facilitator now in shadow mediation and the facilitator will only listen to the parties during the mediation, right? The facilitator is only listening to the parties and once arbitration starts, the facilitator starts taking active part in the process. Why do we have this mechanism? Facilitator does not have to play any active role as long as mediation is going on because he is only observing, he is only listening. His real role starts when the process of arbitration starts because there comes the possibility of bias operating against one of the parties and there comes the role of the facilitator. He starts taking active part in the process. This kind of mediation is called as shadow mediation. This kind of MEDARB is called shadow mediation. The second is mediation final offer selection. This is initially mediation. And if mediation does not yield any settlement, then finally a final offer is provided to be accepted or rejected. So this is a kind of non-binding stage where a final offer is provided for the parties. So detailed arbitration will not be done. Then you have concilio arbitration, as the name clearly suggests, it starts with conciliation, you can see, it starts with conciliation. After the stage of conciliation is over, a draft award is prepared and if parties do not object to the draft award, then that award becomes binding on the parties. Then that award becomes binding on the parties. These are the some of the names which we use for MEDAR, shadow mediation, that is a good process because there is a shadow monitoring the whole process and will take care of the disadvantages which I mentioned. I said the concerns of bias, concern of bias is a serious matter because that finds place in section 75, 81, etc. of part 3 of the Arbitration Conciliation Act. And therefore, concilio arbitration is something which is not going to happen in India because a conciliator cannot become arbitrator between the same parties. So, this is not possible in Indian context by virtue of part 3 of Arbitration Conciliation Act. It is ruled out. Although it is not a process where you have full conciliation followed by full arbitration. It is not like that. It is conciliation and once it is over, a final award is, is prepared. And if the parties do not have any objection, then that final award becomes binding on the parties. So this is about MEDAR. The next process which can be very useful is early neutral evaluation. Parties may differ on likely outcome of the case. Early neutral evaluation plays a very important role. Where the evaluator meets the party at the early stage of the dispute. The evaluator meets the party at an early stage of the dispute before the matter has become complex and evaluator does an assessment about the dispute and gives his report to the parties. The idea is to identify and reduce the number of issues. I may think that there are n number of 5 issues, 10 issues in my favor, 
the other party may have five other issues in his mind. Now, the evaluator will make assessment about the dispute, gives his report, and on the basis of report, what happens is we identify and reduce the number of issues. This process was used in 1985 for the first time by the Northern District Court of California in 1985. It was used for the first time by the Northern District Court of California. And the role of neutral was extended beyond investigation. The neutral person here helped during the process of investigation to evaluate the dispute, submitted his report. In fact, the role was extended beyond this stage of investigation and he was allowed to place proposals to be used by the court for deciding the matter. So, there lies the role of early neutral evaluation. Another important process is mini trial. Mini trial is a moderately formal non binding arbitration. Mini trial is moderately formal non binding arbitration, like case presentation. We discussed MEDARB, it starts with mediation followed by arbitration. Mini trial is non binding arbitration followed by mediation. This is converse of converse of MEDARB. Of course, there are features which make it entirely different, but yes, we start with arbitration and then we go to mediation. So, it is time bound non-binding arbitration followed by mediation. It is a moderately formal non-binding arbitration. It is like case presentation held in office or conference room. It is made by councils. In this process, the evidences usually come in the form of affidavit. Documentary evidences are allowed. Cross-examination is not allowed. What happens here is, presentations are made at two levels. The councils will make presentation first before the CEOs or top management of both the parties. And then the councils will make presentation to the neutral third party. Try and understand. It's a kind of case presentation where councils are presenting the case in front of CEOs of both the companies, disputing companies. If not CEOs, top level management people will sit in, in the conference. And then the presentation shall be made before the neutral third party. After the presentations are over, a non-binding opinion is issued by neutral third party. And then the parties retire to talk settlement. Now, if they fail to settle, the neutral becomes a mediator and attempts to facilitate discussion and induce a settlement between the parties. That is what I said. It starts with a non-binding arbitration kind of thing followed by mediation. So, what is the process? The matter is presented by councils. Submissions are made in written form, in the form of affidavits. No cross-examinations shall be allowed. Councils will present the matter before the CEOs of both the companies, first of all. And then councils will present the matter before the neutral third party. On the basis of presentation, a non-binding opinion is issued by neutral third parties, a neutral third party. And now the disputing parties are allowed to retire, asked to retire and discuss a possible solution. If they are successful in evolving a solution on the basis of non-binding opinion issued by the neutral third party, the matter ends. If no settlement emerges, then the same neutral third party now becomes a mediator and facilitates discussion between the parties so as to settle the dispute between them, right? This is the process called as mini trial. The mediation, see, during the stage of mediation, mediation is benefited because of the fact that CEOs also know about the strength of the case. It is not that two parties completely unaware about their the nature or strength of their case are coming together to mediate. No, it is not like that. In the first stage, it has already been, the strength of the case has already been presented before the CEOs also. 
So top level management has heard the case through the mouth of adversary. That is one. CEOs have seen their own counsel's performance. They also know how the case played to the neutral third party. They had the opportunity to evaluate the resources that will be required to carry the case through trial. Now, these four points make it easy for the mediator to facilitate discussions, negotiation, bargaining and settlement. CEOs are aware about the strength of the case of both the parties because they have heard the case through the mouth of adversary. They have seen their own counsel's performance. They have also seen how a neutral person is responding to their case. They get an opportunity to evaluate the resources which they will be spending if the matter goes to trial. So, because of these factors, when it comes to the stage of mediation, it is not difficult for the mediator to induce a settlement. This process is well suited for business disputes, large complex business disputes and it enjoyed popularity in USA during 1980s and 1990s. It was initially developed in 1977 in a case called as Telecredit Incorporated versus TRW Incorporated and TRW Data Systems Incorporated. In the year 1977, Professor Green, who was representing one of the parties in this case, case called as Telecredit Incorporated versus TRW Incorporated and TRW Data Systems Incorporated, it was a multi dollar patent infringement case. Professor Green, who was representing TRW, he observed that indeed parties argued just about everything but never seemed to be arguing the case. We argued everything. We argued collateral things, incidental things, spending millions of dollars in litigation without arguing the merits of the case. He says quarters of millions of dollars are spent arguing and deciding unimportant, relatively trivial matters. And therefore, he is the person who proposed the idea of mini trial. And it took just 30 minutes for the dispute to be resolved by using mini trial. So, the method is like a case presentation in a conference room where the councils are presenting the case before the CEOs of both the parties, and then the councils are presenting the case before the neutral third party. Then the neutral third party is giving a non binding opinion. And parties are asked to retire and discuss around that non-binding opinion. If settlement emerges, it is well and good. If it does not emerge, then the same person becomes mediator. By the fact that parties, the CEOs have heard the case, have seen the performance of their counsels, have seen the response of a neutral third party, are now aware about the resources which they will be spending in trial. So, they are in a better position to reach to an amicable settlement and the role of mediator therefore is much simpler as compared to a situation where the parties are unaware about the strength of their case. This is very useful in case of complex business disputes and as I said it was invented in the case called as Telecredit Incorporated in the year 1977. In the entire process what is the role of neutral third party? The role of neutral third party is to moderate the proceeding. He will highlight crucial facts and issues to the management's representatives, the CEOs. He will reconvert what has become a lawyer's dispute into business person's dispute. This is very important. He will reconvert what has become a lawyer's dispute into a business person's dispute because you are aware by now that in litigation it is all controlled by advocates. Parties have little role to play. Parties feel helplessness. Even the neutral third party has no active role to play in litigation except for allotting time of hearing. So, it is all controlled by advocates. It is lawyers dispute when it comes to courts. Mini trial is a process where the neutral third party 
makes it a business person's dispute. The neutral third party will narrow down the area of controversy. That is how the parties will be brought together to one settlement. As Professor Green said that indeed the parties argued just about everything but never seemed to be arguing the case. There are a lot of collateral issues and parties spend a lot of time and resources on arguing around collateral issues. That is to be disposed of by the neutral third party. Let's not waste time on collateral, unconnected, trivial, unimportant issues. Let the neutral third party take a call on these unimportant issues. The neutral third party has to encourage a fair and equitable settlement. So these are the responsibilities of the third party to moderate the proceeding, highlight the crucial facts and issues to the management's representatives, convert what has become a lawyer's dispute into a business person's dispute, narrow down the area of controversy, dispose of collateral issues, encourage a fair and equitable settlement. As I said, it is useful to resolve high claim business disputes. Disputes which involve question of law and question of fact both, for example, patent disputes, antitrust cases, contract cases. It's a good method to resolve these disputes which involve question of law as well as question of fact. And the case from where mini trial emerged was a, a patent infringement case. I have already mentioned that in mini trial, one of the features is no cross-examination is allowed. Mini trial can also be institutional ad hoc like any other arbitration. Arbitration can be institutional, can be ad hoc. If you do it through an institution, it becomes institutional arbitration. If you do it according to the rules which parties have framed for themselves, it is ad hoc arbitration. Ad hoc arbitration is arranged by the parties. Similarly, institutional mini trial shall be arranged by the institution. Ad hoc mini trial shall be arranged by the parties. But then there are situations which are not conducive for mini trial, which are not going to produce results during mini trial. I have identified those situations. First, whether either party or key figure in one party's team does not want peace either overtly or covertly. The management level people of one party does not want peace. If parties don't want peace, can the mediator compel them to go to a settlement? No. This is not a good situation for ADR generally. Second, hard fact cases. The cases which require examination of witnesses where credibility of witnesses are, is also to be examined, where cross-examination of witness becomes important, such cases are not going to be resolved efficiently by many trial. Third, risk to either party or both the parties is greater than the chance of success of many. When the risk to either party is great, the chance of success of mini trial is less. I, I mentioned that when there is money claim, people usually avoid settlements. So, when there are high claims involved, the tendency is to avoid settlement. Another situation where mini trial cannot be successful is where the party, the adversary, cannot be trusted. It happens. There are few parties who can never be trusted. They are warrior by personality. Such parties may not be brought to settlement by way of mini trial. So, most important thing is the cases which involved examination of witness, where credibility of witness is also to be tested with the cases of involving complex facts. Such cases may not be resolved by way of mini trial. So, these are some of the hybrid methods which I wanted to discuss. MEDARB is one, one, one hybrid method of dispute resolution. Early neutral evaluation is, is other. And we also understand the meaning of mini trial as a mode of dispute resolution. Now, before I conclude the session, 
I will generally talk about impediments to settlement because we have seen the advantages of mediation, conciliation, negotiation and some of the hybrid processes. We also talked about multi-door courthouse which says that there will be various doors, not only litigation. Let's also explore the possibility of other methods of dispute resolution because there are advantages in other methods of dispute resolution. But then I would like to come out with a list of impediments which create troubles for settlement generally. These are the factors which create trouble for ADR generally. So let us see what are these. In some circumstances, we must understand the settlement is not in client's interest. So do not impose settlement. For example, if the client wants binding precedent, it is not possible in ADR. If the client wants to impress other potential litigants, that is not possible in ADR. If there is no relationship concerns, why are we sending the parties to mediation? Then the cost of contesting the claim is less than interest earned on the money. If I know that the cost of contesting the claim in court is, is, is very less, then I will prefer to go to court. So, sometimes ADR need not be recommended. If I want binding precedent, how can I get that binding precedent through ADR? So, therefore, one has to keep in mind that ADR need not be recommended always. But sometimes an examination of the impediments of settlement reveal that at least one party wanted something that can never be achieved by ADR. So, if it cannot be achieved by ADR, why to recommend ADR for it? Now, let us come to impediments for ADR, impediments to settlement. First is poor communication between the parties and or their lawyers. Poor communication can happen because of different cultural backgrounds and mediation therefore is useful in keeping the parties apart and acting as translator. We have to understand that we have to separate people from their problem. Then only we can bring them to settlement. So, poor communication between the parties is one reason why settlements do not happen. Second, parties need a space to express their emotions. They think that they won't get that place in ADR. Mediator may act as a safe harbor for parties to express their views fully. Third, there may be a situation where there are different views of facts and greater the parties disagree on these matters, on question of facts, greater is the disagreement here, the more difficult is settlement. If parties greatly differ on question of fact, settlement is difficult. Again, mediator plays a role. Mediator can persuade the parties to keep aside, put aside their factual dispute. Next impediment is different views of legal outcome if settlement is not reached. As I have already said, disputants often agree on facts but disagree on question of law, disagree on outcome. An appraisal of likely outcome by a neutral evaluator may be useful here. Next impediment is ADR is unlikely when the emotions are high. ADR is unlikely when the emotions are high. When the relationship is in terrible condition, ADR is not likely. Next impediment is linkage with other disputes. If the resolution of one dispute has an effect on other disputes involving one or the both the parties, this may complicate the whole process of negotiation or ADR. If the dispute between you and me, if the resolution of dispute between you and me is connected with other disputes in which I, I am one of the parties and this decision is likely to affect all the other decisions, all the other disputes, then I will prefer to remain away from this settlement also. That is what I mean by saying linkage with other disputes. A similar issue is involvement of multiple parties. 
a multi party dispute is a difficult case for adr there is a very significant point different lawyer client interests you must have observed it in day to day life i am not saying anything against the lawyers but there are certain lawyers who never want parties to go for adr yes it is possible but the lawyers must not see adr as something which is going against their interests councils have definitely some role even in adr so in relation to settlement of dispute lawyers interest may be different from client's interest not in all the cases in some of the cases yes true then there is something called as jackpot syndrome there are people who will always tell you that yes you have a very strong case they will talk to you for 5 minutes and and will declare that you have a very strong case let the matter go to court and in court you will definitely win it such a syndrome you also start feeling the same this is called jackpot syndrome and if the parties suffer this jackpot syndrome then the chances of settlement chances of success of adr is very low the next point is public perspective if public purpose is better served by court decision then adr should not be suggested if public interest is better served by court decision then adr must not be suggested for example interpretation of constitution interpretation of statute there is a class action these are the situations where adr need not be suggested so what we have discussed in these 20 hours i introduced the meaning of dispute we discussed in the introduction part we discussed the meaning of adr kinds of adr advantages of adr i discussed how arbitration emerged in the form of regulations eventually became an arbitration conciliation act 1996 how different conventions came at international level then we devoted good number of lectures on arbitration because that these days is the most preferred mode of dispute resolution starting from section 7 which talks about arbitration agreement we said you cannot have arbitration unless you have an arbitration agreement then we said if you have an arbitration agreement you will have to do arbitration section 8 we decided the number of arbitrators it must not be even section 11 to section 15 is about composition i said the new section 11 which came in 2019 along with part 1a of the act has not been notified yet so as of now the amendment which came in 2015 in section 11 is the law section 16 and 17 talk about power of tribunal rule of competence competence and power of arbitral tribunal to pass interim measures we compared section 9 with section 17 power of court to pass interim measures and power of tribunal to pass interim measures 18 is equality provision of this act from 19 to 27 we talked about conduct of arbitral proceedings 19 is about procedural autonomy 20 is place of arbitration 21 is commencement of arbitration 23 is pleadings 24 is hearing 25 is default 27 is court assistance in taking evidence this is a very important provision safe minimum mandatory provision whatever procedure you adopt you must definitely include the requirements of section 27 from section 28 to 33 we saw the making of award and termination of proceeding 28 gives substantive freedom freedom of parties to choose substantive law proper law of contract you don't have this freedom if it is pure domestic arbitration 29a is particularly important nowadays because for the first time in 2015 amendment a timeline for making an arbitral award is introduced 25b very ambitious it talks about fast track arbitration where the award is to be passed in just 6 months from the date when the arbitral tribunal enters upon the reference section 30 is similar to section 89 of cpc an opt out provision where the arbitrator is under an obligation to encourage parties to go for more amicable methods of dispute resolution section 31 talks about form and content of an arbitral award 32 gives you the instances of termination of proceeding 33 is about correction interpretation and for additional award the mandate of arbitral tribunal revives 34 is a very significant court intervention where we discussed about power of 
court to set aside an arbitral award. There are fixed grounds. We discuss something about arbitrability, non-arbitrability of a dispute. We discussed about public policy in detail. The meaning of public policy has changed over the years. From Renu Sagar to ONGC to the amendment of 2005, a lot of changes have been introduced. We discussed about the changes which came in Section 36 in relation to enforcement of an arbitral award. I did not discuss Part 1A in detail, although I referred to it while discussing Section 11. Part 2 is a closed part, as I have been saying. It only provides for enforcement of New York Convention Award, Geneva Convention Award. We saw the difference between the two, Section 44, Section 53. These two differ. Section 48, Section 57 differ. Chapter 1 is different from Chapter 2. Chapter 1 is for New York Convention Award. Chapter 2 is for Geneva Convention Award. We also discussed about applicability of Part 1 to foreign state arbitration. Now there is an amendment, a proviso has been added in Section 2, 2, which says that except for four provisions, Part 1 shall have no application to foreign state arbitration. We also talked about choice of law, party freedom as regards choosing procedural law, substantive law, proper law of arbitration agreement, proper curial law. The rules were discussed and then we came to more informal methods, more amicable methods. Lecture number 18, 19 and 20 were devoted to methods like conciliation, negotiation, mediation and in the present lecture we talked about hybrid methods. ADR is any consent based process which takes parties to settlement. Arbitration is a binding process although it is also consent based. Therefore, in the beginning also I said the name of this subject is not just arbitration. The name of the subject is ADR and arbitration. That's all I have for you on this course on ADR and arbitration. Thank you very much for attending all the sessions. I hope you have understood the basics of ADR and the basics of arbitration after attending these 20 sessions on the subject. Thank you very much once again. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare 
as a rheumatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.